and this is this is actually our our first anniversary as well. Um, so you know, I'm sorry we can't share any champagne, um, and we don't have any even virtual fireworks. Uh, but uh, there's there's a celebratory atmosphere in a case. In fact, yeah, look, there are some celebratory emojis um, kicking off. Um, but anyway, this is a really exciting venture because this is a collaboration between the health equity interest group and the clinical AI interest group. Um, so looking forward to lots of cross-pollination. Um, Brio is here as well. Um, and I'll hand over to him in a moment. Um, and um, just a couple of quick um, points of interest from the clinical AI point of view. Firstly, summer school is on the 20th of July and the advert's going out really soon. Uh, things have really crystallized around that. Um, and particularly excitingly, it looks like in the afternoon, we're going to have a practical computer vision um, machine learning session. Um, so I think that'll be a really exciting um, addition to it. And then the second thing is um, super groups. So anesthetics and ITU is kicked off with Sandy Jackson. Medical imaging and computer vision is kicked off with Alex Deng. And then the next on the roadmap are women's health. Um, and neurology and neuroscience. Um, and so we'll have some more news about those next month, but we'll be looking to, to launch those, I'd say over the next four weeks. Um, in terms of upcoming events, in June, we're doing a collaboration with the Data Science for Mental Health Interest Group. Um, so a particular focus there for any clinicians or healthcare workers who are interested in psychiatry or work in that field. In July, we've got Piers Keen. Um, from Moorfields Hospital joining us to talk about health AI in general, but with a particularly ophthalmology focus. Then in August, we're going to take a break. Um, and in September, we're going to be um, doing a session with the with the Omics interest group as well. Um, so some exciting things ahead, but nothing more exciting than being in the present. Um, and Brio, over to you. Thank you, Nick. Um, great to see so many people here. My name's uh, Brio Lehman. I'm an assistant professor um, at UCL in, in the stats department. Um, I'm also one of the, the co-organizers um, of the health equity interest group um, at the Turing. So um, hopefully we'll recruit a few more people to, to join the uh, interest group um, through, through, through the course of, of this webinar. Um, so that the interest group is really for anyone working at the intersection of you know, data science, machine learning, statistics, um, and and health equity, um, or any anyone with like an interest in between to make sure that you know the latest data driven innovations in healthcare um, benefit the, the health of everyone. Um, we we have a, a strong a, a close partnership with the Data Science for Health Equity um, community, and I'll, I'll pop a bunch of links um, in in the chat um, very very shortly. Um, and the kinds of activities that that we run, we have um, a couple of webinars uh, coming up, so regular webinar series. Um, a, a reading group on um, statistical methods for health equity um, and a couple of on ongoing activities, one in particular around trying to create a, a landscape of, of researchers um, who are working on kind of methodological development um, for, for health equity to kind of get an idea of who's, who's working in this space and to try and be able to connect people um, who are maybe on the more applied side with uh, to people on the more, the more methodological side. Um, so I'll, I'll pop a bunch of uh, more information um, in the chat very shortly. Apologies for my voice, by the way, I've, I've got a, a horrible cough and I'm just about uh, not croaking. Um, so um, I figured, um, I think that's all, all, all I wanted to say about the, the, um, the health equity interest group um, for now, different ways to get involved, different mailing lists you can join um, as, as, as well. Um, and just if in, in a moment, just because I've, I've only got the one screen open, I'll, I'll, I'll pop all the links um, in in a second. Um, Nick, Nick, what, what's next on the uh, on the, on the on agenda? The yeah, I yeah. just wanted to say that the um, uh, Data Science for Health Equity, like the Dishy newsletter, is really good um, and really really well written. Uh, and I, I always look forward to it popping into my inbox. So. Um, that definitely encourage anyone to sign up to that. Um, plug, thank you. <laughs> I think, uh, and, and your voice is sounding pristine as well, not, not even an element of a croak. So yeah, don't worry on that account. Um, and um, to, to meet hopefully across the interest groups as well. Um, but we're going to move on to our thematic session now. And um, Brio, would you like to introduce? 
Absolutely. So um, my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Hong Han Wu. So Hong Han is one of the, the, the co-organizers um, of the Health Equity Interest Group. Um, it's a pleasure to work with, obviously. Um, uh, but other than that, so in, in, his, in his day job, uh, as it were, um, Hong Han's an associate professor um, in health informatics at, at UCL. Um, and also a fellow of the uh, Alan Turing Institute. Um, he leads the, the No Lab uh, Health Informatics Group um, and co leads the, the Clinical uh, Natural Language Processing Group at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and today he'll be talking on a, a topic relevant to uh, happily both, both these uh, clinical AI and, and health equity interest groups, um, which is the, the notion of fairness in the context of AI enabled clinical decision making. Um, so without further ado, um, over to Hong Han. Thanks, Brio. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can okay, you see my screen okay? Good. Yes, all good. Okay, let me um, in a presentation mode. Okay. All right. Yeah, thanks, Brio, for the introduction. And uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, just a little bit about the research focus, my um, Myself and my group um, are doing especially includes natural language processing, which is a, a kind of AI technology. We're applying this uh, NLP uh, for short and clinical uh, nodes a lot, um, working with different energy trusts. So anyone in the clinical AI interest group interested in that, please um, yeah, take a look about what we are doing and uh, potentially get in touch if you're facing uh, the issue, uh, the, the challenges of applying AI in healthcare. So we do have some um, UK-wide uh, networks mm -hmm. called Health Techs and Health Tech Conference is coming in Manchester 2023. It's in June 15, uh, 14th to 16th. And mm -hmm. you can look at that up. Uh, I can put a link later on if people are interested in how AI can be applied on free text. Okay, as, um, okay back to this uh, talk. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, fairness in AI-enabled clinical decision making, and uh, particularly as I'm trying to address the problem is, uh, what is what do we mean by fair in clinical decision making? And uh, given all these different notions or definitions, frameworks of fairness across uh, different uh, disciplines, why isn't it being um, applied in a scale or evaluated? And the AI models, for example, you see all the papers published about AI in healthcare, in medicine, but very few, um, or I haven't seen too much about evaluating their models in terms of fairness in real world settings. So why is that? Um, so uh, a little bit background, uh, for those who attend the recent Turing and Roche uh, Institute um, event, uh, you might, you know, I gave the talk um, about first half of these, today's talk, so I, I will be very brief about the background. So inequality in healthcare is a long-standing issue. And uh, because uh, the issue actually um, resides in the representation of the data we are using for AI training and evaluation, uh, which means that this is a very damaging for AI in medicine if we don't treat this properly. There's some, just one example about um, Isabel's work, Isabel's PhD student based on UCL of um, evaluating AI algorithms for predicting um, liver disease status using a widely used um, data sets from, you can get it from Kaggle or whatever. So people using it a lot for, for machine learning and practicing. So we find, she finds that false negative predictions for, uh, for female is uh, doubled compared to uh, male. So that's a, a high um, in, in quality um, of these algorithms for predicting whether the patient had disease uh, or not. So another piece of work on the right-hand side of the slide is uh, iNews article, which actually introduced this work, uh, this spells work, and also many other works um, in this area. If, if you don't really yeah. uh, want to read uh, you know, uh, academic writing, uh, research articles, maybe that news articles can be of interest. So fair, fairness, uh, the concept itself is quite uh, vast, ambiguous as this paper um, uh, mentioned is a work from UC Berkeley. 
So a very long paper, 36 pages, define the disciplinary confusion, which means that the fairness definition between different disciplines is quite different. It really depends on use case and on the things that data set you're working on, the scenarios you're working with. So uh, they give very good framework how to kind of uh, <clears throat> how to define fairness, especially working with multidisciplinary team together. And so the, the, the main uh, <clears throat> takeaway message, I just put this highlight here is a concept of fairness of vast and biggest and uh, different to use across different disciplines. So it's a difficult concept to have a, a consensus on so-called fairness, that's general. So there's another paper from uh, Harvard uh, University about AI and uh, algorithm bias in the um, medicine and the health system context. So just highlight these um, on the right hand side, and that's there's no bothery with uh, recognized uh, qualitative summary uh, metric for fairness. So the evaluation of AI and is effectively qualitative is subject to the uh, evaluator and the scenarios. Mm -hmm. So that's another um, aspect. But in fact, um, fairness definition, if we look at this mathematical um, theoretical background behind how to, how to define fairness, especially associated with algorithm, machine learning models, actually there's uh, uh, plenty of work out there already. So there's a 2018 um, kind of survey paper, look at the fairness um, definitions. I just put their table one on the right hand side. As you can see, there are about 20. They summarize about 20 different definitions about fairness. So this is a uh, they collect these all these definitions from the top venues of AI and machine learning, including those uh, conferences like NIPS and big data, chip AI, so on and so forth. So um, you can look at the citations, some of them as to why they used. But the fact is in healthcare, why haven't the community, hasn't the community evaluated? Because we all know this is a big issue if we don't uh, evaluate this um, fairness or inequality, the AI will you know, do more harm than good. So why hasn't this been applied in AI uh, in medicine then? So our hypothesis uh, behind the difficulty is threefold, three factors. First, uh, it's really difficult to choose one from all these available frameworks, especially when you apply to your context. For example, if you have AI model to predict, to, for, for example, AI model to help screening of uh, depression compared to another scenario like using AI model or machine learning to locate ICU beds in a pandemic, for um for severely uh, affected patients, you don't really know which one fits in which scenario better, uh, given all these different definitions. That's one of the, the difficulties for um, users of these frameworks, and sometimes some some of these uh, metrics evaluate things quite differently. So your your AI model might be deemed to be fair, uh, but um, this is actually not fair if you're using different metrics. So that makes things uh, even harder for people to take a decision about which one to use. And also um, it's some, some definitions are too complex and uh, or, or too generic to be uh, applied. That's another technical challenges. So I say too complex because it's the concept, especially for uh, users of AI or uh, applications of AI in clinical scenarios. Um, it's the technical concept terminology is just too um, too hard to be uh, conceived or applied in their scenarios. That's the technical challenge behind that. The second um, <clears throat> factor behind the difficulty of um, evaluating AI uh, existing frameworks um, in AI in decision making AI in medicine is in clinical settings. A lot of this type of variable, essentially the variable look at to predict, for example, disease status or whether patients should be admitted to hospital or not, is unfair itself. So the left-hand side is a, is a um, screenshot from a science paper 2019. It's one of the landmark paper about 
um, unfairness or algorithm related bias. So this is an algorithm used in US systems by looking at the, using the cost to predict the health needs of the patients. As they evaluate in this particular figure, the x-axis is the, what the algorithm predicted with the probability of the patients need um, particular resources. And the y-axis is the um, kind of objective evaluation about the health needs using multimorbidity, the number of multimorbidities a patient has at that time. The two, um, two curves, um, the yellowish one is the white um, patient group. The other one is a uh, black patient group. If we draw a vertical line, any point uh, from exercise um, upwards, as you can see, the, um, the same predicted score, the black patients are, always have more multimorbidities, which means that they're more severe, which shows the uh, unfairness of this algorithm in, uh, in reality. So the reason behind this is the algorithm uses a wrong uh, target variable, which the cost. So, but the issue of that in healthcare or in medicine is quite um, widespread. So, um, for example, if you're using um, diagnosis, uh, the the actual data in your in your data set to say I'm uh, using these ground truths of diagnosis as ten as ten codes to see the patient has the disease or not. Um, but the problem is that diagnosis code itself is unfair in a certain degree. That's just an example. Looking at the breast cancer um, is from JAMA uh, a few years back. So um, essentially, the white people uh, and versus non-white people, non-white people always has later stage diagnosis of breast cancer. This in, implicates these patients are more likely to be late diagnosis compared to Y patients, which means that if you're using this kind of data in your hospital data, uh, electronic health records, uh, the data itself is already biased because we predict those very accurately, which means that you always late diagnosis um, non-Y patients. So that's the second factor why kind of framework could not work. If the framework uses the Y, the, the target variable, which itself in clinical decision making scenario is unfair, but this is actually happens uh, very often. So we show one of the examples in the IEC data sets uh, later on. And the third reason is um, we always need um, conditions or inputs in terms of what we, do we mean by fair, especially break down to the actual health needs of the patients, whether the patient needs this kind of, for example, surgery, or they need the kind of treatment or not. But kind of frameworks hard to get uh, clinicians inputs or the, the clinical decision-making um, metrics they use a lot in their day-to-day -day work, how those kind of metrics can be applied uh, or combined with existing framework is so difficult for this uh, existing framework, uh, which is surveyed by this uh, 2018 um, survey paper. So these are three reasons. So that's the background. So what I'm going to talk about is about one work which um, we have done recently, as it, uh, in fact, as last year, trying to come up with kind of a, a new framework, which is not totally new, because as you, can, as you will see later, it's kind of linked with different existing framework nicely, but it's more like break it down or make it easier to be applicable in um, AI in medicine decision making scenarios. So it's called deterioration allocation framework. So the, uh, the idea is um, to abstract clinical decision making into so-called resource allocation scenarios. So what do I mean by that? So I look at the top line, we have resources uh, from um, healthcare service providers, for example, hospital admissions, ICU beds, treatments, surgeries, and so on and so forth. And the bottom, we have patients. So the scenario essentially is you have AI model in the middle, try to allocate resources to the patients, which is in the queue. 
of course, um, in the resource limited scenario, which means that we cannot serve all these patients, we have to choose who to allocate resource to, uh, given their actual health needs. So that's the an abstract scenario. Um, so in this scenario, what do we mean by fair or fairness? So essentially, the idea is the same level of health needs should get equal access to um, healthcare a service provider provided resources like ICU beds, hospital admission treatments. And then the key question is now, what do, how do we evaluate the health needs, right? Just give you one particular uh, uh, concrete example. Let's say we're going to um, assess whether um, to a patient need uh, kidney surgery or not. Right. So one particular aspect people are looking at in the clinical decision making in this particular scenario would be do some blood test. For example, look at their creatinine reading. So creatinine is the uh, a reading trying to assess the liver, uh, no, it's not liver, sorry, a kidney function. So in fact, related to similar to um, creatinine, there are uh, many biomarkers like this. There's a, a survey paper about this, uh, all these biomarkers. There are 25, more than 25,000 diagnostic biomarkers and about more than 100 prognostic biomarkers which assess the progressness of the patient conditions. So this 102 um, biomarkers can be used as a way to objectively assess the health needs of the patient in particular disease clinical um, decision scenarios. Not necessarily using one, but also um, trying to combine different biomarkers to assess the overall general uh, status of the patient's uh, health, and essentially to quantify, combine together to quantify the needs. That's the um, how we assess health needs. And this is how this kind of um, clinical Dysemic scenarios now happens to day to day at NHS can be applied or can be associated with the framework we have. Um, so essentially, uh, once we have the health needs evaluation, we can have this kind of um, resource allocation scenario. So we have these um, two dimensional um, space that X access, just like any AI model, it can predict the probability to locate the resource to a patient. That's essentially as a score comes from the AI model or machine learning model itself. The Y axis comes from the health needs assessment. We call it deterioration index, which in deck, which uh, quantifies the health needs using, for example, one of these biomarkers, one of these two, 102 uh, prognostic biomarkers or combinations of them together or you have different assessment. And once you have these two indexes, the one is allocation index, the other is deterioration index, then you put patients into different groups. For example, patient group one, which is the uh, blue curve, uh, patient group two, uh, sorry, uh, the patient group one is the yellow, the brown uh, curve, patient group two is the blue curve. There you can quantify your model and the models um, in quality, and look at this difference of area under these two curves, because this essentially quantifies how, um, how the different deteriorated if you more give the same kind of uh, predictions for they need the same level of resource. They actually have differences in terms of uh, their deterioration index, which is y axis. Essentially, in this particular example, uh, patient group one is um, disadvantaged by your algorithm. So that's the scenario. Then how this is associated with all these frameworks out there, because we already have more than 20 frameworks, why we introduce a new one? So as I said, uh, the, the new one actually is kind of, it's a more generic one, but make it more concrete to be a critical in the clinical decision making. So look at the one, this table is comes from um, a notion of fairness a recent um, survey paper again in this particular area, the right two columns is what I put there, how these models can be applied, that there are issues of application in healthcare, 
and how this um, new framework is associated with these existing notions of brainness. So I'm not going to read them one by one. Essentially, this, um, this summarize uh, the issues of resistant models and how these at the AUC, we call it for short, uh, can be uh, linked to existing models and can make it more concrete in uh, AI medicine scenarios. Okay, I'm just skip this slide a little bit of time and um, probably have 10 minutes left. I'm going to talk about, um, I'm, I'm gonna skip all these technical details, just give some results. Um, three aspects, one is about data set embedded in quality and second is AI model inducing quality and the third is unfairness in terms of ground chase. So, uh, elevate um, definition. So our model can qualify data set based qualification, uh, data set embedded um, bias or in quality between different groups. Essentially just quantify the probability of different groups to having abnormal readings using certain biomarkers. Then quantify this D basically quantifies that. Is basically between two groups, you can, you can use this formula to quantify the, dif quantify the differences in terms of the probabilities of having abnormal um, readings in certain using certain biomarkers. The second thing we can quantify is the model related um, inequality or bias. Essentially, it's the error on the curve differences, uh, as you can see on the right hand side. Okay, so that's just a very um, brief discussion about technical ideas we need for quantify, first look at the result essentially. So let's look at the first um, experiment, trying to see whether our model can quantify data embedded bias if there is any bias within the data. So we're using a data set called high rate, it's a ISU data set, a public available. Of course, we have got approval from the data owner. Uh, more than three, uh, 33,000 ICU emissions from uh, Switzerland. And uh, the scenario we're looking at is ICU emissions um, to these um, ICU centers and compare female versus male when they are admitted to ICUs, whether we can detect any uh, bias based on the data. Okay. So um, for deterioration index, uh, which is very important to quantify the health needs of the patients, we're using uh, several uh, metrics. One is called um, creatinine, as I mentioned, it's about liver disease, uh, about kidney condition. Then ALT is another biomarker, look at the liver condition. Then general um, deterioration index called um, multimorbidity, but kind of more uh, normalized by consider the patient age as well. So can normalize number of modern mobilities. So three different um, deterioration index to, um, to evaluate the health needs of the patients. Okay. Then the experiment, what we're trying to do is um, whether we can quantify uh, the bias. So we have to do this in a controlled uh, environment, which means that um, it's kind of synthetic data we created and gradually increase the bias um, of course, the consensus that they have created trying to have no bias. So how we do that, essentially what we did is from the high rate that I said, we just randomly select 10% of data, uh, but only those male patients, okay? 10% male patients only admitted uh, to the ICU. They randomly choose 50% of this patient in the data in, uh, from female to, uh, from male to female. So, so purposely change the uh, gender. Then do this several times, more than 10 times. Then we, we can assume if you do your evaluation of these data sets, there's no bias because it essentially comes from the same page, uh, gender in you know, a male, actually just uh, purposely change the male, uh, half of the patient's data uh, agenda to from uh, male to female. Then, so that's that. Then what we did, uh, we want to, control this bias. So we did is just uh, gradually change those uh, female uh, data uh, in from uh, the metric uh, a little bit towards a more healthier side from the three biomarkers we changed, right? For example, um, creatinine from abnormal readings, uh, slightly better, slightly better uh, to, towards um, normal readings. 
similarly apply to ALT for liver disease, okay, for liver condition. Um, so that's why we did. So two different data sets, one is with result bias, the other is gradually uh, increase the bias into our data set for the females, which means the females are, are healthier when they're admitted in our ICU, of course, it's, it's kind of things that is created from real data set. So compare all this, we first apply this model on this no bias data set, which is uh, just change the agenda, do this 10 times. Then as you can see, look at the creatinine and ALT readings. Um, there's a kind of, we did some uh, T test to see whether a model can detect any uh, bias. Essentially, look at the p-value is not significant, which means that we cannot re reject the uh, null hypothesis, which is um, the average uh, value of uh, mean value of the difference in terms of quantified health inequality is zero. So which means that we detect no bias between all these 10, 10 times of the synthetic data sets we run 10 different times. So which is good. There's no bias. We more detect no bias. Then we gradually, as I mentioned, look at these uh, figures here. The one x axis basically gradually increase uh, the healthier readings for the female patients. Then the quantification of bias is look at female versus male. So the negative value at the y axis means that the female is advantaged, which is that they are healthier when they are admitted to the ICU. So we look at the trends. Uh, essentially, as you can see, for all the three different uh, biomarkers, uh, we can, um, the model can quantify when you gradually increase the um, bias for the female, make the female uh, healthier, the bone actually can de detect this. And this is a kind of gradual increasement of the inequality, uh, inequality for females. Actually, it's a kind of inequality for male in this particular scenario. So we did a uh, uh, correlation evaluation and to find these strong uh, negative associations of this um, codification of inequality associated with these um, gradual improvements of uh, female patients' health status. So which means that there, when there's a, a gradually increased uh, inequality, our model can detect this uh, accurately. So that's the first experiment. So the second experiment that we'll look at uh, real uh, kind of resource allocation scenarios like um, kidney surgeries. We're using different data sets, called MIMIC-3, which is uh, um, US-based ICU data sets. So we'll look at two scenarios. One is a renal uh, or two uh, transplantation, basically tra um, transplantation of the um, kidney, uh, one particular type of surgery. The other is a more general kind of any operations applied on kidney in this particular data set. We use case control uh, studies. Um, so we use, this is basically some details about some machine learning models we developed, uh, the feature set, uh, the uh, search space of um, uh, hyperparameters. Essentially, this summarize, um, we're using lots of regression and random forest, which is uh, one, uh, two uh, most commonly used algorithms in this kind of uh, scenario, very simple models. The model a rock AUC uh, relatively good uh, in two scenarios, and uh, the cohort is slightly different. One is bigger, the other smaller. But the, both of them are highly balanced um, scenario. And so let's look at um, kidney operation in general uh, for logistic regression. And this is just the model's performance between um, female of uh, between white and non-white uh, subgroups. Essentially, we do a 10 for cross validation and run this 10 times, and then evaluate on the test that I said, uh, compare fem um, white and non white patient groups. As you can see in this particular uh, scenario, the judicial correction actually is uh, more accurate in terms of F1 score uh, in non white patients compared to white patients, about 1% uh, better uh, consistently across different folds. But if you look at uh, the um, creatinine uh, using our quantification framework, um, which is a difference between the two uh, areas on the curves uh, over the, and the areas between these two curves, uh, the uh, purpose ones are those non-white patients 
which are then more deteriorated uh, if you model using this model to uh, allocate the surgery resource. Um, much, much big difference actually uh, using creatinine. Um, this is using multi mobility and the, the bias is slightly better, but still uh, the non white patients uh, are disadvantaged by your model, which is a shady area, it's a decision making area um, using 0 0.5 threshold to allocate resources. Okay. Um, then similar situations you can uh, uh, can be observed in this um, another uh, surgery um, scenario, um, but in this case actually F one score is better for uh, for white, but even in this situation uh, in this situation we also observed bias for non white in terms of the uh, deterioration status. So only so I have to finish this in about one minute. Okay. So um, then let's look at the unfair ground cues. For both scenarios of uh, kidney surgeries, we quantify data set uh, embedded uh, bias. Um, just summarize, uh, the, the thing at the top is for the female, because the female and the male have different normal readings for creatinine. And that's why we have to compare them separately. So for female at the top, Non-white versus white. white Non-white people have about three, uh, thirty-five percent in quality, which quantified by our framework, which means they are more deteriorated when they uh, got this uh, kidney surgery decision. Uh, same things can be observed uh, on white uh, on male patients, but the difference slightly slightly better. The quality is slightly better is about nearly twenty percent of in quality, but still sub uh, significant. Uh, in terms of their deterioration status when they got the uh, um, surgery decision. Okay, just very quickly summarize. So there are many fairness definitions metrics out there and AI and data induced inequality are not assessed widely, at least for now. There are different reasons we discussed about that. So we introduced the duration allocation framework, which try to make things more concrete for practitioners in AI medicine, so we hope make things um, easier and uh, conceptualize easier for people to use. And also, so the framework is easier because uh, we can consider clinician inputs by using different biomarkers they're using already uh, in the clinical practice so far. Okay, that's basically me. Thank you so much, Hong Han. Uh, I'm sure I'm gonna clap, clap on the behalf of everyone. Um, I can see some clapping emojis popping up in the in the participants. We've got we've got time for um, uh, a, a few questions, so I'm going to keep an eye out on the um, participants for anyone who's got their hands up. So if you do have a question or a, or a comment um, for Hong Han, then please do um, put your hand up and then just unmute. Alternatively, um, I can see so Sedalia. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced that right. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, so we know that bias is impossible to remove bias from data and 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 from uh, and from everything. I think there has been a kind of overall sense in the healthcare that AI is going to come up and resolve everything. And there is a little bit of, I would say, a lack of awareness of a lot of healthcare professionals about these problematic areas. So how do you see the way forward in trying to educate healthcare professionals around the application of AI models and their kind of uh, limitations uh, around this? So my master thesis was actually about the news to score and the kind of prediction model assumptions and the risks of that model. So I, I think that the, there is a critical need here to try and address like how how do we educate people about this? Because I think a lot of business are selling this as well, it's going to solve everything. There's not going to be any new problems. It's going to detect everything when actually in reality, it's not exactly like that. Yeah, that's very good, very good point. I think that's very important. We make the, um, the users, uh, especially um, the uh, policymakers and NHS and practitioners like clinicians uh, who are going to use this technology and also the patients themselves are aware there's a huge issue behind this. And that's uh, one of the purpose of health equity uh, interest group, right? 
and uh, the dish and you know uh, Bill is uh, organizing I think is doing a fantastic job in terms of um, allow, at least uh, allow people know there's a big issue behind this. I think very rightly you said you know news things like what people are really using in clinical decision making uh, scenarios like news two uh, scores uh, whether they are causing any issues we uh, we need to evaluate them we need to do this um yeah like these the work we're doing and you know like these news articles come out there basically bring this kind of messages to the general public to all the practitioners that you know look big and uh, you know we have to be um, aware of this at least then we have to mitigate this and at least first quantify this then how to mitigate this or even if we could not do a mitigation we should uh, take it into a consideration and how the human can work together with these models to make a more a better uh, more fair kind of decisions in their practice uh, that'd be super super important yeah uh, nick i think you're next Thank you so much. That was a really interesting talk. Um, two quick things. Firstly, do you think that the um, the kind of outlook in the future, would you like to see that when people publish work in the field, so, you know, producing different tools for detection or diagnosis, that they might include health equity work as a standard in those publications? Yeah, definitely. I think that's a must have. I think we we I think we're connect contacting uh, publishers or trying to say, look, we should have guidelines, right? There are some clinical AI guidelines out there already. So we should um just like uh, a lot of journals uh, require different guidelines with different publications. So we need that kind of guidelines for AI models in especially the applications in, in healthcare. So definitely that's something we should uh, work um, towards as a community. And um, so th and then one other question, just just for mine, I, I found it fascinating. I didn't realize how it worked, but taking basically creating synthetic data sets and then tuning basically parameters within that in order to detect the influence of bias on a model. You gave the example of um, sex, so in, you know, um, changing the male to female ratios. Could you also have done the same thing with race in that particular deterioration index model? Yeah, it's possible. I think people people are doing that. There are some model a framework trying to do some variations, a counterfactual, a kind of assessment of different models in different scenarios. It change says changing a, a race as well. As some of these techniques people are using to say, you know, let's say trying to change this are you having different decisions for these patients yeah awesome thank you so much thanks thanks i think we might have time for a very quick question from from mike before before we need to wrap up but i'm going to suggest that people um uh, post any questions on the dishy slack workspace uh, to hong han that you can follow up afterwards so, over to you mike okay thank you um so i'll be very quick um so i guess two kind of related questions um Firstly, is it the case that um, if you've got a genuine um, effect in there, which also correlates with your variable of bias, let's say race, let's say there is some disease which is actually more common in one racial group than another in reality, is your degradation model able to preserve that? Preserve in terms of the uh, the associations between certain factors like uh, race associated with their deterioration. Yeah. So if you if you extract the bias which comes from the the data set, then it, are you able to retain a real effect which is also correlated with that variable? I guess is my question. Yeah, I think the framework just quantify this as so far. So it's not okay. trying to trying to figure out the causal relations behind this and also okay. how to mitigate, mitigate this we haven't so of course there's a different line of work so this works yeah, more yeah. Like education yeah Probably okay yeah okay it's, it's a very interesting piece of work it just makes my mind jump forward onto how do we distinguish between biases and real effects and how do we mitigate them without removing predictive value i guess um, yeah. but it's really fascinating thank you very much fascinating thanks, talk. thanks. Thank you everyone for the wonderful questions. I'll pass over back to uh, Nick or Alicia just to wrap up. 
It's me, thanks, Brielle. Um, fantastic. Really, actually, we could, we could spend all afternoon, uh, I think, talking about it. But um, all the links, lots of links in the chat um, to different groups and and making connections um, and sharing ideas. So uh, I encourage you to follow up some of those and sign up to the newsletters and um, and share with others as well too. If you find it interesting, then do signpost others. Um, to these groups as well too. The next meeting is on the 27th of June. It's on Tuesdays, uh, 12 o'clock. So the times, uh, the same, the date has changed if you've got an old um, invite. So it's the 27th now of June. Uh, and it's a focus on mental health this time. So um, the clinical special interest group for data science from, um, <clears throat> sorry, clinical AI group and the data science for mental health um, groups coming together. So lots of opportunities to make some uh, cross links in those areas as well too. So uh, Nick, is that an old hand or is that a new hand? Very old. <laughs> Very old hand, put your hands down. Um, lovely, uh, lovely. I really enjoyed the um, kind of coffee chat breakout bit as well too. Um, it's lovely to hear uh, more from the names that we see popping up in the boxes. Um, we won't keep you any longer. Thanks ever so much for joining us today. Thanks very much to um, to everyone that has contributed and added questions and um, and Hu Hongwu as well to fantastic presentation. Really, really, really important. Um, look after yourselves and uh, we'll be in touch and newsletter coming soon again. And every, every, lots of thanks to Emma for helping to coordinate that too. Um, have a good afternoon. Thanks, Emma.